Hey, what's up, garden friends? Hi, Tucker. How you doing, bud? You good boy. Jeff here, Tropical Plant Party. How's everybody doing? I hope you're good. I am great. Why is everybody submitting to me? What did you guys do? Toby, what did you do? What did you do? You're okay. You're a good boy. Oh, finally stopped raining. Look at Helva. Well, that's on the outside. Okay, need to clean the windows. No big deal. All week, just rain, 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 and oh, too much. Yeah, I mean, way too much. Some of the plants have just drowned. And a hanging basket. I've never had a hanging basket get, that's, that's crazy. They dry out so fast. <laughs> so I've turned my drippers off. Get out of there. As, as I was saying, turn the drippers off and uh, checking things out. What's on the door? Oh, it's from some tape. There's a sign up there. Like, look at this hydrangea. Oh, something just got me. Look at it. Poor thing. I pulled the drips out of this last night in the middle of a storm. The entire pot was just full of water, completely saturated. And I went ahead and I gave it a little bit of a tilt so it could drain more quickly. So it looks like the water's worked its way out of there, but oh, the poor thing. Backyard flooded. I mean, it wasn't terrible. The flooding in the backyard's been worse before. You know, all these houses, there's a house here, a house there, and two over there and one over there, all of them drain down into my yard. So there's drains and things up on the hill, but sometimes it's just not enough and the water comes over and gushes over. And that's why in some of these videos you see me going around being like, I need to get these drains cleaned out. Like under here, there's a drain, but you can't, can't see it right now because of all the flooding and everything covered it up. So those have to stay cleared out. But so yeah, that water comes over these walls and just pours into the pool. Usually fills it with mulch. Not a ton of mulch went in, so that's good. And then it sometimes will even come up and over this berm because there's another drain down there and there's a storm sewer on the other side of the patio. Lots of pipes go to it. That's why sometimes it's hard to plant things in certain areas. But yeah, that water like came up and was all over and everything. And there's a drain there that's gonna need to be dug back out. It's just, you know, lots of rain. Went to the baseball game on Sunday, yeah, Sunday, which was a lot of fun, but had to sit there for like two, two and a half hours before the game could start, because rain, but it was still fun. And the next day, almost got trapped in a flash flood, so that was terrifying. And here we are a few days later, now that the rain has subsided, some soaking wet hydrangeas that need to be dried out. It's not supposed to rain for a few days, so it should be okay in that regard, it just kind of sucks, because Poor thing looks terrible, and the storms messed up my arbor. I got a really cheap arbor off of Amazon, and I was gonna wait to show it until it like filled out and looked pretty. But um, I think that the it, you know you get what you pay for, right? <laughs> it just it won't stand upright. I'm probably have to sink some stakes in the ground and attach it to the stakes to get it to stand up. It was only 25 bucks, and this staircase it's hard to tell from right here, but this little staircase from where you can actually put something in the ground on each side it's about eight feet it's hard to find arbors that big that don't cost a few hundred well several hundred dollars into up well over a thousand this is 25 bucks so i was like hey, i'm gonna try it and you know you, like i said get what you pay for right but you don't know until you try I'm just tying up some odds and ends out here and i remembered that i had this pothos pole i wanted to do with this pvc i need to get a cap to put on top of it so let's go to the hardware store Eh, another palm tree blew over. That's the one nice thing. Remember when I was trying to find, for any of you who've been around for a little bit, when I was in the vlogs trying to get these brown pots to put underneath my windmill palms? I'm, I'm looking around trying to find some, but they're all covered in flowers. I don't know if you'll be able to see the pots. <laughs> see, you can't even see it through the sweet potato vine. These brown pots, let me see here. Yeah, it's a brown pot, but it doesn't have any sharp angles to the sides which is nice for tall plants that get blown around very easily. That would would have been smart to put the other palm trees in because they'd be a little bit more stable and they wouldn't wobble as much, you know what I mean? Before heading out, I don't have any like big projects planned for this week because <laughs> the week's almost over because it rained all week, so couldn't really vlog. Um, but the Magnolia update, I went ahead and I treated it with the systemic and I need to get out here and pull this lace vine out that's growing up this sand cherry out here. 
that's got to go. I need to double check the nest. There's a cardinal's nest up here. I need to make sure that there's no one in there. Because the cardinals still fly up there, even though the babies fledged like a long time ago. So I don't know where they're hanging out. I think they've been going like up more into the magnolia. So little things like that that'll be going on. I'm going to pull this lace vine out. I might just cut that sand cherry out altogether. The lace vine, I didn't plant it there. You know, they can be a weed or people buy them and plant them. I can see why because they're absolutely beautiful. But um, I don't want it near a systemic. It has lots of flowers on it and the pollinators really like it. So I don't want to hurt any of the pollinators. So that's got to go. It needs to go anyways because it's like eating the magnolia up there. So that's got to go. And then um, hopefully I'm going to get all the supplies I need to do the pothos pull so I can do that video, which I meant to do like a month ago. But you know, sometimes you just forget things. I got a little blues decal. Not blues. These aren't the blues. This is just St. Louis. But it's for the Cardinals, um, or just St. Louis Athletics in general. I've always wanted one of these. But I've never been like someone to want the rainbow things on their car. But I don't really care anymore because my bucket of cares is empty so this isn't vlog worthy is it don't worry it's no big deal it's just i thought it was cute i wish it had sparkles on it though should i put some holographic glitter on there just in case the rainbow's not gay enough as it is must add glitter no i probably won't be doing that although sometimes the glitter is very pretty i was going to put this one over here but like there and take that off because I don't need a blue sticker on each side of the car but it turns out that it doesn't I thought it would just peel right off turns out no not not so much so gonna have to rethink that that's kind of cute no don't do that oh yeah the flash flood didn't really emphasize anything with that this road was blocked off right here so I uh, had to go around a different way and that road was blocked off too so I turned around to go a different way, and that road wasn't blocked off, but like you could see where the river, I think is actually just a creek, you could see where that was getting ready to come up over the road. I wasn't able to get any good videos because there were police officers and stuff like directing traffic, and it seemed kind of like just very, like so deliberately disrespectful to like hold your camera up and be filming something while you're driving right in front of a police officer. It didn't, I just seemed disrespectful. See, so yeah, I don't really have good footage of it, but that was a little bit freaky. Never had to deal with that before. Got lucky there. Now it's just like, hey, I almost got trapped in a flash flood and just moved on with everything. Sorry about that. Look at that. Well, you probably want to see the plant first. That's was cool. It's a calendula. So cool. Winter Wonders Peach Calendula. Pardon the shadows. The new perennial calendula blooms from late spring to fall, even past first frost. That's neat. Minus 10 to minus 20. Pretty cool. I always love a new reblooming perennial. Especially ones that the pollinators will enjoy. That was hard to say for some reason. And they're orange and they're cute. And it says we'll bloom past frost. That's kind of a vague thing to say, but neat. Should I try one? I could work these into a fall container so easily. The problem is, guys, I overbought for the fall containers. It always happens. So I don't really know what I'm going to do there. But this would be, I already did the perennial one. So, hmm. That might pair well with this delicious purple hummingbird mint. It's an Agastache. Oh, hello, tag. 0 to 10, the 16 high by 12 inches wide. Bloom summer and fall. And yeah, the bees really love this. I like orange and purple together. I think they're cute. They pair well. Just, the, well, kind of. Eh, maybe not. In general, I usually like them together, though. Because if this one gets 20 inches high, this would go behind that Agastache. That might look nice. I mean, here's some larger Agastaches that would grow behind it. Eh, I'm not feeling it. Coneflower? All oh, those are kind of cute. I think that's just because I like coneflowers, though. Wait, what's happening? I didn't come here for plants. I've had a lot of trouble finding Calibrax, and they have a whole bunch of them here, but they're like these ready fill containers. So they're 10 bucks a piece, and this, I don't really need that. I wish I could find a six pack. But the Calibrax are really nice in fall containers because with the cooler temperatures at nighttime, they still keep going and look really nice. There are other options, like there's pansies over here. 
pansies are great, Celosia, and snapdragons. But still, there's still like all of September coming up for me, and I don't know how hot it's gonna be. Sometimes September can be really, really toasty, which the Calibrax can take no problem, but I don't know with pansies and snapdragons. Well, the snapdragons can usually take the heat too. It's mostly like pansies, cabbage, kale. Those are the ones where you may notice they're not going to be in many of my fall planters because it's just it's potentially going to be way too hot and the cabbage and kale will just bolt and take off. Hmm. I just don't want to spend 10 bucks on one of these things. Wish I could just find a little six pack of these. Although the advantage to getting them in these larger sizes is that there's like not a ton of growing time left, so they're more established somewhat. I mean, they look very full because there's three plants in each one of these pots. So like this, this is adorable, right? But one, not super fallish when you throw that pink in there, which I don't care about because I still think it's pretty, but how would I work that in as a trailer on the edge of a pot, right? I'd have to tear it apart and that could potentially set them back. Oh, I forgot to measure my pipe, but I'm pretty sure this is it. I think, three inch caps, it needs to go over the top of everything. Don't worry about that. I didn't get any plants, what, leave me alone. I just got home. I should really do something about this palm tree, shouldn't I? In the meantime, while I contemplate that, contemplate? Contemplate. Look at this Fetonia. Isn't that beautiful? Lowe's ended up being like super crowded. It wasn't terribly busy, but the, it was just I couldn't like find a moment where I wasn't surrounded by people. And man, the bubbles. Like I have like a space bubble. Don't get too close to me. I don't like it. I get uncomfortable with it. I was just getting run into left and right by people, and I was waiting to check out, not at Lowe's, I went to the grocery store after Lowe's, and like I could feel the person behind me breathing on my neck. What is that? Give me some space. It's gross. Anyways, look, it's Frankie. <laughs> my shaky caffeine hands. There we go. Frankie. So it's a Fetonia, and I just thought it was really pretty. It's not like a rare one or anything like that. I swear my hand doesn't even feel like it's shaking that much. Well, there's that. Very pretty. Really pretty Fetonia. I don't really do much with the house plants this time of year, but I usually save that for winter time when things are, it's, I mean, harder to film, really, because I can't go outside. I like to do things with the house plants. But I already did a Fetonia video. I think this will look nice in a terrarium or something like that. It's just so stinking cute, isn't it? Excuse you, Toby. What you doing? You knocking things over, Tobes? Yeah. Okay, that's okay. You're not in focus. That's all right. But here's what I was camera hello cannot wait to get a new camera hopefully soon i mean imagine that but the way it should be cute right maybe i don't know we'll see but as you know the main reason i went to lowe's is because i have this piece of pipe here that i'm going to use to train a pothos up onto and i needed a cap and i didn't bring one with me but fits fits wonderfully was that whole thing out of focus i'm so sorry yeah so here's that pipe I'm going to be using total overkill for planting up a pothos, but I'm really doing this more as an experiment for maybe something to use for my Monstera in the future. And um, I liked the, I'm going to be repeating all this when I do the video, by the way, so sorry about that. But what I like about using the PVC is that I can put a coupler on there and just, <laughs> camera's not liking things right now, and put a coupler on it and add to it to make things go up and put different things on them to make them branch out if I want to. I don't know, that'd be a cool thing to try but have to have a lid on there or else water is going to go down in that pipe. Although I'm going to be drilling a hole in the bottom of it anyways. That was an odd emphasis anyways. And I'm using this on the bottom. It doesn't have a label on it. So if anybody knows what this is called, I would appreciate it if you would tell me. I got it at Lowe's. It was on clearance. It didn't have a label, so they sold it to me with the stuff it was with, which were toilet flanges. This is not a toilet flange, not that I'm aware of. I think it might be what's called like a bell drain, maybe, piece. I don't know for sure. If anybody knows for sure, let me know, because that'd be a useful thing to know before I make the video where I put this together, which will hopefully be out next week, like a few videos from now, if not the next video, because it's something I need to get done. I did find some pieces on Amazon that looked pretty similar to this, and they were called like bell drain something or others. They had screens over the top, but I mean, I could pluck that right off. I just, I need to know what this is called, one for the sake of that video, and then also because I need to be able to reproduce this. I need to be able to do it again. If I like the way it works out, then, like I said, want to repeat it. So I need to know what that is so I can buy more. 
Also, they had this gigantic whiskey barrel on clearance, half off. Great price, and now I know what to do with the rest of my fall plants. I'm going to do one gigantic fall planter, because see, here's the thing. I did the one with perennials, which should be out by now, and then I want to do one that's just like a typical fall planter, and then I wanted to do one that was like a tropical fall planter. So, but I only have two containers. So, see the problem? I needed a third. This will work out fine for that. I think. I don't really do it with whiskey barrels. They don't really go with anything I have, but the price is right for something that's this big. This thing is absolutely gigantic, so it's going to work out well. And then, as you know, I did get that Winter Wonders Peach Polar Calendula, which I think is just so happy and cheery. And I also grabbed this tricolor sedum. I've been eyeballing these every single time I've been there the last several weeks, so I was like, I'll go ahead and get one. The last time I planted one of these tricolor sedums, it completely reverted, but whatever. I'm going to give it a shot. I like the little, well, you can even see there's one in there that doesn't have the, I guess I should probably just pluck those out, shouldn't I, to keep the variation going. But as temperatures cool, they get more of a pink hue to the outside. You can kind of see it on some of these because the nighttime temperatures have been kind of chilly. I mean, not chilly, but like in the 60s, which it feels chilly to me at this point. But yeah, they'll be more pink when things are a little bit more cool outside around that white creamy outline. Which I think is neat, and these are hardy all the way to zone 4, so I'll be using it in a pot. Maybe in my boot planter on my front porch, because that way I don't want to put anything in there that I'm going to have to come out and water in the place I put that boot planter. Uh, it doesn't, like, there's no drip running to it, it would be, like, too obvious, and there's no real, well, uh, <laughs> there's no real way to hide that drip, so I thought this might be nice, just something simple that'll come over the sides and be low maintenance. That's what I want, and perennial. I have just an assorted portulaca in here, it doesn't have a variety name on it, but I like the colors of the flowers, and I just was surprised I hadn't planted any portulaca yet this year, because it's something I usually plant makes me happy. Pollinators enjoy it. It's fairly low maintenance, low fuss. Sometimes they'll even reseed, which is fantastic. I love an annual, like snapdragons will do that. Apparently impatience will do that. We learned that in my front yard this year. And with portulacas, I usually have these reseed for me. So I was thinking I would either put this or the tricolor sedum in that pot. I don't know yet. We will see. And then y'all know about the Calibrax, right? I went ahead and I got one. So I was like, well, if it's all I can find, then I'll just have to make it work. And so, is what it is. It'll do. Alright. So, back to work. Need to repot this Adenidia palm. So I just had it, like, sitting in this pot, but it needs to actually go into the pot. It'll be stored in a greenhouse over the winter time. So I'm not really worried about the time of year in relation to repotting it now. You can see I have two holes drilled on the side, one kind of in the middle. I do like to get those holes so they're like kind of up a little bit, just that there's no risk of water pooling or anything in the bottom. So that if need be, they can get a really nice heavy soak. I don't have to worry about any rot or anything like that. Adenidias, you know, the Christmas palm, Adenidia morellii, these are a palm from like the South Pacific, Philippines, whatnot. They come from areas where the soil drains very well, but it's also very organically rich and there's a good amount of precipitation. So needs to go into soil, kind of like that. As close to it as I can make it, <laughs> on my budget at least. So I'm using just an all-purpose potting mix here. There's some bark chunks in there, there's some perlite, there's some slow release that I'm not going to rely on having any value to. I'm going to add some more slow release to it. And now let's do some sand. By some I mean a lot. Okay, and then I've also added in some uh, bark chips, hardwood bark chips. They'll break down a little bit more slowly, create some air pockets so things can drain nicely. Almost looks like cork. A sprinkle of Espoma Biotone Starter and a sprinkle of Espoma Palm Tone. So it gets the magnesium and everything that it needs. Typically, I would use multiple levels of sand. So this is more like a very fine gravel or a really heavy grade sand. I would like to put some fine sand in here too, but I don't have any, and I don't really know if it's going to be necessary. I don't really need to overdo it too much, as long as the soil drains well. That's all that really matters. And then uh, there's a, a pretty hefty amount, actually, of slow release in here as well. So I'm just going to blend it up, and that's pretty much all there is to it. Uh, sometimes I'll add some um, activated carbon or charcoal but there's already some in this potting mix. I don't think I really need to. I don't have a lot of problems with water around here. Like, we don't have fluoride in our tap or anything like that. So it's a little bit unnecessary, and, I mean, for the palm trees. So it doesn't really need it. Okay, I mixed it up. Things are nice and homogenous. 
I did want to talk a little bit real quick about adding organic matter to palm mixes. With palm trees, it's pretty much understood that they like to be somewhat root bound, right? The problem is in a pot, what I'm doing with these, these are going in a pot, not in the ground. Organics break down. Well, that's the same thing as in the ground. But what I was going to say is that as these things break down, they will compact. Almost turns into like a sludge or a mud. Soil needs to fall apart. It needs to be loose. It needs to drain well. Oxygen needs to be able to get in there for the roots and everything. So uh, even though, technically, maybe, if putting the palm tree in a large enough size pot, that might mean it could leave it in that pot for several years and not worry about it, right? That's kind of the mentality with palm trees. They like to be root bound, it's fine. Not really though, still, if there's gonna be a lot of organic matter in your pot, I mean, the soil as it is should be organic matter. Stuff that breaks down, so, you know, not sand, not rock, but peat, coconut, manure, I mean, whatever you're using, that's going to break down. So uh, what ends up happening is it'll compact, won't drain as well. That's one reason to, at the very least, pull the plant, refresh the soil every couple of years. But also, even though they like to be root bound, to an extent, like I said, the nutrients get sapped out of this over time. So eventually what's going to happen with the palm tree, let me, <laughs> fun angle, eventually what's gonna end up happening after a few years, decide, oh, I don't need to repot this. Palm trees like to be root bound they're going to become nutrient deficient. There will be spots and things like that on the foliage. Maybe it's putting out tiny little leaves instead of great big lush full ones. That's a good sign that they need to be repotted or at least you need to pull them from their pot, get a lot of the old soil out and pot them back up into the same pot if you want to with some nice fresh soil. So that's what that's, that's, what that's all about. And I'm just going to, you know, do the thing. Okay, and then when looking at the roots of the palm trees, another common mentality is you don't even need to loosen them up. That depends. I have had Adenidias and Robolini palms choke themselves out before. If the roots are swirling, going in a circular pattern, like you can see how that's starting with fine roots right there, which is fine, but it's to a point where you don't see any soil in there and it is just roots, I'd go in there, cut some of that out so that they can kind of regrow and then they don't choke themselves because that can happen in a pot. Now you don't need to go through, like I'm actually probably not going to do anything with the roots on this. It looks totally fine. They're moving straight down. They're not wrapped or anything like that. This is totally fine, not a big deal. When I repotted my mule palms, if you saw that video, those were wrapped fairly tightly. So when I repotted them, I did take a blade and made tiny, just like a few little X's through the roots pulled a few chunks of root out so that those could branch out and go in different directions. Not all palm trees are like this, by the way. Some palm trees like sable palms, if you cut the root, then chances are the rest of that root's going to die. But with the Edenidias, they're not really too picky about that. Same thing with those mule palms. They're part Butia, which is the Pindu palm. And then they're part Queen palm, both really sturdy palms. They respond okay to the root pruning. The Eureka palms have done that as well. I wouldn't call it root pruning, but that is kind of what it is. But this is just an example of fine roots. There's nothing wrong here, nothing squishy. They're all firm. These are good. They don't need to be loosened or anything. I am probably just gonna take this and plop it right on in there. I'm not worried about it. Yeah, see here, no swirling. So you could take your hand and just lightly rough that up a little bit. That's all that needs to be done. Very simple. And then maybe another reason to loosen those roots up that I should have mentioned would be if you notice when you unpop the plant that there's a lot of clay around the root ball sometimes. These guys are root, or not root bound, field dug. And that happened with one of my spindle palms. Went to repot it and I was like, whoa, this is just in pure clay. That poor thing has been recovering all summer and now I've, there's a vine growing on it that I need to cut off. I was going to leave it for the um, honeybees, but they I'm seeing the honeybees on all the other plants. So I'm not gonna let that vine just kill my palm tree. It doesn't, I don't know what I was thinking there. I was just sort of waiting for them to, find a new place to feed and now they have. So uh, what I've done here is when I get to just about the top of the soil, I'll usually add a little bit more slow release. And then if I'm using like the Biotone or any type of starter fertilizer, I'll add a little bit more. That's why when I mix up like a big batch in here, I just use a sprinkling, but I like to make sure that that goes in more towards the top of everything. Cause that way it gets watered and dispersed through everything evenly. Uh, so there's a, another sprinkle of that in there. And that's pretty much it. I did pop this kind of low. I did that on purpose because I like to be able to give them heavy soakings and whatnot. And if they're potted up too high, then that water, you know, it just goes all over the place. So having it a little bit lower 
allows me to be able to give them a heavy drink. And I'm just filling in. And then I'll water, see where the soil goes, and add some more. That's it. Not a big deal. I will do this every couple of years. Yeah. Nice, right? And then here's another example of things to watch out for. So, perlite and bark, both floats. So, it, uh, if your soil's not a little bit moist when you first do your pot up, it might just come to the top. That's one reason pumice works really well, or if you can find lava chips, that works great. Those are both a little bit more pricey. But also, if I were to decide this isn't draining fast enough or it's not drying fast enough, then I can take a fine grade sand, fill the top with that, and uh, like even just go through poke some holes, water it, and, and over time that sand will disperse itself through and it will help with drainage. But you gotta remember, sand does actually retain some moisture. So, and so does pumice and the lava stone and pretty much all of these things. Perlite, not so much. It, but otherwise, this got a very, very, very heavy soaking. And you know, you can see there's some clumps here where the perlite kind of pulled itself out and that came up. And whenever I use something like Espoma Biotone, sometimes things retain a little bit more moisture so that's why I've been using it a little bit more lightly with my tropicals at least in the initial repot so this got a very 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 heavy watering I'm gonna let it dry out I mean not completely but mostly and then I'll get that put back that probably won't happen today though now it's nice and heavy probably should have put it back and then watered it in but you know, know. whoops Okay, and I did want to clarify, if I was making it sound like the Adenidia is like a dry soil by talking about the drainage and the sand and everything, disregard that. They like a consistently moist soil. It does need to dry a little bit in between waterings. So the consistency of the soil is going to vary from climate to climate. If you live someplace that's very, very dry and arid, you may not need to be adding as much to this mix to make sure that the soil um, dries out faster. Where I live, since even though they'll be in a greenhouse, that greenhouse isn't like super, super hot. I still want to make sure that it drains freely. I don't want any water pooling up in the bottom of the pot or anywhere in there because it will cause root rot, which they don't like. I mean, no, no plants like root rot, right? That's just with root rot. Pretty just easy to figure that one out. And pardon the mess. This is going to go back there. I need to put a new, <laughs> need to get a more sturdy crate to set it on. The other thing I did want to mention that I should have mentioned before, sometimes these nursery pots, see how they'll have the holes up on the sides, which is great for getting more oxygen into the pot, but keep an eye out, no hole in the bottom of this pot. There's like a tiny little tear in one of the corners there. So if you ever pick up a plant where those holes are up on the sides like this, be sure before repotting it or really as soon as you get the plant home to get a hole in the bottom there at the very least or when you're repotting it like I just did to make sure that that very bottom of the root ball isn't mushy and nasty because that can happen sometimes if that happens you'll need to cut that off there we go <laughs> I think I covered everything I wanted to say here with the adenidias like I said consistently moist soil is fine as long as you're in a hot climate where it's not going to stay wet for too terribly long kind of like you would want for maybe a fern something like that and it can dry between waterings as long as it's not cold out, meaning like below, I'd say 70 to 75 Fahrenheit, then uh, the moisture is not really something you have to worry about as much as long as, like I said, it drains freely and it doesn't stay wet for too terribly long. I just didn't want anybody to be under the impression that these need a soil that dries really quickly like a cactus or something. Not the case. It just needs to drain quickly. That's the thing. It needs to drain quickly. So that's to avoid risk of puddling. I said it enough. You get it. And uh, on the note, when I was talking about earlier about repotting every couple of years because soil will compact, that's what happened with that hydrangea tree down there. I should have repotted it in the springtime, and I just I didn't do it. See, I've wanted to get both of these hydrangeas into new pots, actually something much larger over here, and it just didn't fit the budget this year. So I was like, well, I'll wait till next year. But you see what happens that soil compacted didn't drain as well as it should have and filled with water so now i ended up having to come out in a storm basically and tilt the pot over and put things underneath it and poke my finger up in the hole to make sure water could escape from there so this could have been avoided it's been in that pot for roughly two years this would have been the year to redo that right so that's what happens that's why it's important every couple of years even if the plant seems fine repot it 
better safe than sorry. And this is one of the other reasons, by the way, my Lespedes is starting to bloom. And they're not out right now, which is fine, but the honeybees love this shrub so much. And they've been on the lantana that has flushed out with lots of new growth. So I'm not worried about pulling that vine off my spindle palm. There's a spindle palm if you don't know what I'm talking about. I just, I let that vine go on it. And then I, I've decided though, I'm gonna take it off. It doesn't need to be there with all the other things that are out here. So I'm gonna come and trim that out because it's breaking the palm tree. I can't have that. It's not necessary when there are all these other flowers out here for everything. So uh, I do have another one of these vines growing up against the house. I need to pull it down because I can't reach it. And like I mentioned in the last vlog, I can't let these things stay and pop open. These are on there because I'm gonna take this vine out but I need to be able to reach that one so I can pull those out. So I'm still leaving one of them, which is fine. Look at this oleander. Isn't it pretty? And they're very much enjoying the uh, gingers too. This is the flaming torch and it still has like several weeks, maybe a couple months of blooming left on it. So lots out of, <laughs> lots of things out here for the pollinators. <sighs> Last thing, <laughs> I just sat down on the ground. I wanted to give an update because somebody asked me how my Restrada was doing. It is doing wonderfully. I got this back in March, early March. It was shipped, it was in a video too. I did a whole video on it. When it came to me, it had no roots on it, which isn't terribly unusual. It's just a trunk with some foliage on it. I potted up in a soil that drains pretty, pretty well. Nice sharp drainage, top dress it with some gravel. And it has a nice big hefty head of new growth that's been flushing out of the top. So it's doing well. It's like slightly protected where I have it. There's not really much of an overhang right there, but the palm trees up there do it. Oh, oh, we're gonna talk about that in a minute. The palm trees shelter it a little bit. Not too terribly much though, but the soil drains really well. I would say I probably water, I watered it in when I potted it. So it did get watered then back in March. That was just mostly to distribute the soil though. And then since then it's only been watered once a month. And that's because once a month I have been giving it just a little bit of this miracle Grow Shake and Feed tomato fertilizer. It's not because of the miracle Grow that I like it, it's because it's tomato fertilizer, which has a decent amount of calcium in it. And succulents, cactus, they like some extra calcium. All the plants actually do really, calcium helps build stronger roots, stronger cell walls and whatnot. So that's all I've given to it. I just give it a very, very light sprinkle. I usually pull some of the gravel back give it a little sprinkle and I do that like in I think four different spots around the pot and water it in and that's it that's all I've done with it and it's doing absolutely wonderfully not, not to the point where I would have it in the ground it's too late in the year to do that anyways if you're going to put something in the ground that's like questionably hardy where you live I'm in 6a 6b the restratas are usually rated as hardy to zone 5 and zone 6 but I mean I would consider them only reliably hardy in zone seven and up. And that's because there's a lot of variables with climates. If you have a really, really wet winter in zone six, and then that wet is accompanied by temperatures that are typical of a zone six winter. So, I mean, usually we stay below freezing, below 32 degrees here for several weeks during the winter. There are a few days where it warms up into the forties and then generally like mid February and on things are a little bit more mild, but that would rot this out. So, I mean, especially in a pot, I wouldn't even consider keeping this outside in the pot. But if I were to want this in the ground, I would have needed to have put that in the ground, like, I don't know, April or May probably would have been best. But since it didn't have a root structure, I didn't want to do that with it. So, I mean, I'm happy with it just as it is. It's easy enough to keep live in the winter. I just throw it in my garage with everything else and that's all I'm going to do with it. I probably won't even water it. I'll keep it away from where the water will spray and everything. And It'll be fine, and then maybe next year I can debate putting it in the ground, but I do actually have another one of these that's not as pretty. It doesn't have as much blue on it, and it costs, like, I want to say $70 more than this one does. This was 100 bucks, which I know is a lot of money. It's one of my, like, bucket list plants I've always wanted, and when I was able to find it, I got it. And that's really, it's a lot of money, but that's not bad. That's not bad at all for this plant. It's, like, from the base of the plant to the top with the foliage, probably a good three feet. And there's maybe two feet of trunk in there, 18 inches probably. Well, I know it's tacky to talk about the cost, but that, that actually was a very good deal for this. But it's still a lot of money and it's not even that part of it. It's that it's so hard to find these. That's why I didn't put it in the ground. 
But, you know, the cost is relative because it has a lot to do with whether or not you want to take the risk, the gamble of keeping them outside in the wintertime. So, and here's that other one I have, which actually is pretty blue. This one came potted up. It, it is taller than the other one, too. And it has fresh new growth coming out the top. And then here's its old foliage. And I am going to leave the old foliage on this one and the other one because as time goes on, that'll be almost like a beard across the trunk. And it is supposed to help with their cold hardiness. Because one nice thing about these is I don't have to bring these in with all my other tropicals, right? They can stay out probably all the way until December, maybe even early January, depending on the temperatures. I'll move them in when temperatures drop below 20 Fahrenheit, just to be safe, even though they should be able to handle that. Just because, like I said, the cost. I can't just go replace these for really cheap. That's not going to work. Like, at one time, I had windmill palms over in my garden and pindu palms, and every single winter I would wrap them with lights and do like a whole greenhouse thing around them and I I liked it it was pretty cool doing that especially when they're in the ground they grow so much faster but the thing is like windmill palms they are so expensive they grow like snails especially in a pot right and I got to a point where I was like I don't I don't want to be gambling I don't want to be rolling the dice with this anymore I'd rather just put them in pots I don't have to worry about them. I can still keep them outside when temperatures are fairly cold, when I don't have anything else out. But when things drop below like 20 with the windmills, I move them in because I want to keep them looking nice. If I were to put it in the ground, like I said, April or May, and then in the wintertime, I would protect it. I would probably pull all the foliage together and tie it loosely so that it's kind of shaped like this. That'll help keep moisture from getting into the center. And then I would probably put a... Uh, enclosure around it that I would cover with some frost cloth probably not plastic because plastic is going to hold in a bit of moisture because the cold they can take to an extent right but the wet not so much the main thing is to keep them dry so there are things that could be done I just didn't do it I wanted to start to get it established and whatnot maybe next year I'll give it a try with my other one but for now there's the update on my restrata one of my favorite plants I have out here, and like it's just, it makes me so happy. I am so thrilled with how incredibly beautiful, blue, and vibrant the foliage is. Typically, you don't get a really blue color on the foliage of a Rostrata unless it's like the sapphire skies or a known like hybrid. It's not really a hybrid, but you know what I mean, a known variety. And this is, I, it was just a Yucca Rostrata. So I got lucky that it's this blue. It's so pretty. There's that. There's my Restrata update. It's been six months. Um, I mean, I guess it'll be six. No, it's been over six months. So almost seven months. And like I, oh, <laughs> apparently Colby's ready to come outside. There's my tortoise. But if you want to know more like the origin with this particular plant, that video is somewhere on the channel. I'll link it below. As long as I remember, I'll try and link it below when I received it and potted it up and everything. All right. Last thing here. Something I'm extremely excited about. Look at that. Do you see it? Look at it. Oh, that's so cool. This is a triple trunk Alexander palm. I've had it for a very long time. Many, many, many years. It's easily doubled, if not tripled in size. This will be the first inflorescence that I've gotten out of it. Inflorescence. The flower right there. That's what that is, that torpedo looking thing. It's going to flower. That's exciting. I mean... I don't know how long it's going to take, so I may never get to see it because this goes back off to a greenhouse mid-October, but if it blooms before then, that would be pretty awesome. A blooming palm tree is always generally a sign of a healthy and happy palm tree, so that makes me feel fantastic. I can't wait to see what it looks like. I know <laughs> all you people down in Florida, you're probably like, really? You're excited about that? Because the when the seeds come off of these guys, it can be pretty messy. At least from what I've seen. I had an Adenidia years ago that used to bloom reliably. Same thing with um, a, a Robolini. So I still have that Robolini, but it didn't bloom this year because it needed to be repotted. Repo That's a whole different story, but uh, it, it can be messy. But up here in St. Louis, you don't get to see stuff like this very often. So I'm pretty excited about it. I mean, like, really, really, really excited about it. <laughs> Okay, and I did want to note earlier in the video, it's like, I need to come out and cut out this lace line because there's systemic over here. I did chop that down at the root, so the systemic's not transporting up in there. I just need to go through and pull it out, and then still trying to figure out what I'm going to do with this magnolia tree. You know, it's 
got the magnolia scale on it. I'm treating it. So far, I'm not seeing much, but it takes a little bit of time. I'll do a dormant oil on it, and I figure what I'll do is if in the springtime I'm seeing any signs of this on there at all, which I probably will, but I'm going to at least try to fix it and take care of it. But if there's still signs of it in the springtime, then the trees just got to go. It's gotten really too big for this spot anyways, so, uh, and it's, well, I was going to say it's old. It's really not. Magnolias can get very old, so it's not really old, but it just doesn't really fit here. Hasn't in a long time, and then with that scale on it, eh, I don't know. Is in the springtime, and this is, um, Pat left a message on the last vlog, and a lot of people did, and I always appreciate everybody's feedback, but the message was very plain and simple. Do you want to keep treating this with a systemic every year? The answer is no, I don't. I don't really want to be using systemics, period, in my garden. So, uh, like I said, I'm going to give it a shot this year and uh, do the dormant oil, see what it looks like in the spring, and... If it's not looking good, it's going to come out. Odds are it's going to have to come out, though, right? And that's why when I talk about doing the rock garden over here, that's why that hasn't happened yet, because I don't want to spend all that money and time doing this area. Gravel's kind of pricey, too. I looked at some of the rocks I would want to use, like big Mexican pebbles. Very, very expensive. And I don't want to have a tree coming down onto all of that. It's just going to make a mess. And I would rather have it coming down when the elephant ears, the bikini teeny colocages, and the baju bananas aren't growing, right? In the springtime, they'll still be dead to the ground. Dormant to the ground, I should say. So that would be a more appropriate time to deal with that, I think. But yeah, it's odds are it's going to have to come out. But I figure I may as well try. There's nothing else flowering in the area, so I'm not as worried with the systemics. I actually, because of this, I had a bunch of impatience and some things I was going to be putting in the ground over here, and I ended up not doing it. And systemics can travel far in the soil, and they can last in the soil for many years. So uh, it's, it's something I do take seriously, because, you know, I'm trying to be conscientious of the pollinators and everything. So, yeah, I, it's not something I want to have to keep on doing repeatedly. Repeatedly? Repetitively. I did come in here. I took a, uh, just like a regular hose end sprayer, not a hose end sprayer, a pressure sprayer, filled it up with really warm water and put a hefty amount of peppermint oil in it and uh, like blasted them on contact to see if that would do anything. And it doesn't, doesn't look like it did anything. So I did try a natural approach there. I'm going to keep doing that though, because even though there's a systemic in here, I need to stay on top of it because this time of year is when these uh, magnolia scales, those tiny little white dots that are in everything, this is when the babies come out and the babies crawl around and move. So doing a spray is still going to help out with controlling them a little bit. So the problem is I just, I can't get all the way up there. I have a pressure washer with like an injection system I could try, but I don't want those chemicals, even if it's peppermint oil, which is natural, not really a chemical. I don't want that going everywhere because it kills pretty much any bug it lands on. It suffocates them. So yeah, there it is. It's gardening bugs and things are always an issue and figure may as well talk about it might be helpful to somebody out there maybe somebody else has some useful advice for me when it comes to these magnolia scales i haven't had to deal with them before and i'm not not thrilled about it at all storm did a little bit of damage here on the rubber tree the ficus elastica but it's holding up okay i'm gonna go ahead and wrap things up not the longest vlog, but honestly, I really keep losing my voice from talking so much. So I'm trying to kind of pace things a little bit. Ever since I went to Hammer's house party and then I filmed and vlogged and was doing a lot of social things, like I haven't been able to quite get my voice back and I feel it starting to go. So just going to keep it a little bit shorter. Got a lot done this week, um, kind of all over the place. Not really. I tried to keep things segmented where they needed to be. So there it is. I hope everybody's having a great day, great life. Everything's just going beautifully for you. You know the drill. Social media is linked down below in the description. I'm on Instagram way more than anything else. And then, you know, that whole YouTube thing. If you could like the video, I'd appreciate it. It makes a huge difference for the channel, so thank you. And subscribe as well and hit that notification bell because I upload multiple times a week, and that way you'll know when new videos come out. What am I filming here? It is amazing to me how much rain we've had and yet, they're still thirsty in the afternoon when the sun's beating on them. Yeah, that's the way it goes, right? 
everything's drenched. They're not getting water. As soon as the sun's off of them, they'll back out. I just, I don't want the soil to get soggy and nasty. I've actually even had my drips been off, which I think I already mentioned, my sprinklers, like my entire sprinkler system has been off for <laughs> like two weeks probably. So yeah, don't need to water. That's been kind of nice. Uh, the reason I didn't put things back together over here was one, like I mentioned, I wanted to let the soil dry out completely before I do that. Or not completely, but I don't want to be so heavy when I move it back there. Want, don't want to, don't want your head news to dry out completely, especially when it's warm out. But um, I'm going to do some things with this fountain. I'm going to put some screening in around the pump. I might even put in a slightly more powerful pump. So we'll do all that stuff next week. Oh, one more thing. Guys, let me know. Have you been having issues with the Mosquito Dunk products not working? Mm. Or, oh gosh, that frog startles me every single time I'm out here. <laughs> Anyways, um, I'm using the mosquito bits in here, the granules, and uh, I don't know if it's going to show on camera. Probably not, because it's that time of day there's a lot of reflection. Yeah, there's just mosquito larvae everywhere. It's not working. Have you been having that same problem, or did I just get a bad batch? I'm going to try and order some of the actual dunks, the donuts. Actually, I'll probably go buy them, because then I know they're not old instead of getting them off of Amazon. See if that works, but let me know if you've noticed the same thing. Because you don't need to use much with those mosquito bits, like a little bit treats a lot, and I'm putting in a ton. And unless I do a ton, I don't know any difference. So yeah, let me know. How's your experience been? Hey, Tuck. Bye, Tuck. Oh, Toby's here, hey, Toby. Need to put these alakajas away too. Okay. <laughs> actually gonna go now. Like I said, hope everybody's doing well, having a great day, and life's just going wonderfully for you. And as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye-bye!